NACDL is the Association of the Nation's Criminal Defense Bar. I'm here to teach you about geofence war uh, warrants. And like Deja said, this uh, came to my attention in one of my CJ cases, wherein one of my clients was charged with a series of uh, in-home business robberies resulting unfortunately in a victim's death. And uh, the government and law enforcement used one of these warrants um, to try and, well, and ultimately find my guy. So I'm here to share with you what I've learned. And just a disclaimer, um, while I have litigated some of this and I'm still in the middle of litigating this, this is such a new area of law that there's really not uh, a lot of work product on it and not a lot of case law. Um, and so I'm kind of sharing with you what I've learned. And some of my uh, materials include a motion and a dis discovery request. And I've made some additional uh, pleadings to get source code and whatnot I'll talk about. And if you're interested in any of that, and if you have a case similar um, where this is being used, then please contact me and I'm ha happy to share with you anything else that I've prepared. So let's start with the beginning. What is a geofence? A geofence is a virtual perimeter uh, for a real world geographic area. And uh, it could be dynamically generated as a radius around a certain point or uh, an actual fence predefined uh, with pre predefined boundaries. So for example, a geofence could start with like me here on stage and go out 150 meters, 360 degrees, or someone could put together a geofence of this particular room or the block that this building is built on. So it can basically encompass pretty much anywhere in a virtual way. This is, this fence includes all of the data within it. And um, this data is collected within this virtual perimeter for a specified time and duration. Now, just to give you some context of where this came from, this was originally uh, used, and it still is, in corporate and uh, commercial activities. So for example, um, if you are walking down the street and there's a, I don't know, a J. Crew on the block, you might start getting ads on your phone for J. Crew. And here in Southern California, it might be for board shorts. Where I'm from in Minneapolis, obviously they're advertising, advertising sweaters. Um, but the businesses are using this kind of technology to target ads to potential and existing com uh, com customers. And the data that they're getting within these perimeters uh, is anything um, that basically your phone touches or does, right? So accessing internet, uh, accessing uh, t or sending text messages, looking at Facebook, et cetera. Anytime you're doing anything that's connected to the system on your phone, it's being collected. How does it work? Well, every time your cell phone does anything, like I said, uh, that data is connected or that phone is connected to a cell phone tower or a satellite. and all of the electronic communications, calls, text, emails, web browsing, um, it goes through the cellular network. Uh, and it's, it includes times when you're not even on the phone. You're just, it's just on doing its thing. Like right now my phone is just sitting here and I'm sure it's contacting lots of cell phone towers because it's, tell, it's trying to figure out, uh, am I getting new emails? Am I getting new text messages? That kind of thing. And so you don't actually have to actively be using your phone in order for this data to be sent uh, up into the clouds. Your cell phone is also connected to uh, GPS satellites. And so every time you use maps on your phone uh, specifically, and especially, um, and other apps, your phone is talking to a satellite and the satellites are going around our uh, Earth here. Um, and they're receiving all of the satellite signals from all of the devices all over the world. And 
you can uh, you can determine where the phone is um, based on how long it took the messages to arrive from the satellites, how far the satellites are uh, between each other to tri triangulate sites, um, and this allows for a location determination with some precision and. The government and these companies want to tell you that it's very precise, and as I'll talk about uh, soon, that's not always the case. So your cell phone location could be determined by, this, by satellites and also through cell towers. And you may know about this already, about triangulation, but basically every time you're, you're moving through the world, your cell phone is connecting to a tower. And when you get at least three towers, they say that you can triangulate the uh, location of your cell phone just by looking at these uh, different towers and, and doing the math to find out where your phone is between them. Um, <clears throat> and then they can calculate the delay between the towers to determine, you know, with precision where your phone actually is. So all of this data all of the uh, electronic hits to the, to the satellites and all of the electronic communications through cell phone towers is maintained, okay? And where is it maintained? The Google, Google sensor vault. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about the sensor vaults in a minute, but just understand that this is the first place that law enforcement is going to get this information, okay? How does law enforcement get it and what do they get? Well, prior to Carpenter, which I'll be talking about in a minute, um, police routinely uh, asked for and received access to cell site location information, that's the CSLI up here, um, through the Stored Communications Act. And I know that Justin talked about that this morning. You've heard a lot about it. Um, in some states, they actually have uh, statutes that talk about um, what electronic communication can be received by law enforcement under what circumstances. Um, this is our statute, our state statute in Minnesota, and it allows several different ways for law enforcement to get uh, data. But when you're uh, reviewing your materials when you get a case, you're gonna be looking for the search warrants, right? And because of Carpenter, a search warrant is now required. Um, but pay attention to your search warrants because they're asking for a lot of information, a large, large breadth of this uh, cell phone site location information. And you'll see here, I don't know if you can read it in the back, but they're asking for GPS, Wi-Fi, or Bluetooth, and or cell tower sourced location history data generated from devices that reported a location with the, within the geographical region bounded by the following latitudinal and longitudinal coordinates at the times and dates listed below. For each location point recorded within the initial search parameters, Google shall produce anonymized information specifying the coordinating or corresponding unique device ID timestamps coordination, display radius, and other data sources. So basically, they want it all, okay? And if they're doing a Google fence, geofence warrant, where there's an actual fence around a location, you're gonna see longitudinal and latitudinal ranges described in your search warrants. So you can see here, there's two targeted warrant uh, locations on this warrant. In my case, the uh, victims of this robbery uh, not only had, um, it, well, basically they ran an Asian foods grocery store. And much of that business, obviously the groceries were done at the store, but all of the business proceeds and um, the uh, business back end, the bookkeeping and everything happened at home. And it was this home where the robbers went in, my client and his brother went in and, and robbed these people and took a lot of cash. But the, uh, the warrant specified search parameters or geofences for two different places. One, the home, and the bottom one, that was the business. So they were trying to get data for not only the, the information uh, surrounding the robbery itself at the home, but also at the same time for the business, because they thought, well, maybe they're being robbed at the same time, although there was no um, evidence of that. So within these geofences within this latitudinal, latitudinal and longitudinal fence, they want all of the cell phone data. And what is that, my friends? It's a fishing expedition, right? 
They just, they want it all. And then they'll decide what's important, right? Because we totally trust them for that. So what comes from this sensor vault? Well, first of all, officers are going to get a letter from the big Google, from the big G, and it's gonna say, hey, this is our information, we're sending it to you, it's totally authentic, totally, guys. And everything that's within your coordinates is included in our data dump. And so this letter that they received from Google is what they consider authentication. And you just heard about fighting authentication, I, I would suggest that you take advice from our last speaker to um, fight about that, but for your information, there should be some sort of letter from Google telling law enforcement, hey, this is what you're getting and, and why. So what comes from the vault itself, like what are you actually gonna see? Spreadsheets, 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 spreadsheets with numbers. And you can see kind of over here where it says device ID highlighted in yellow, all of those numbers some of them are the same, some of them are different, correspond to different unique cell phones, okay? So you're gonna get a giant spreadsheet full of all the different anonymized device IDs and then where they were within this latitudinal and longitudinal uh, fencing within it. And so any cell phone that appears within this parameter, they're gonna scoop up that data and that's what the officers, that's what law enforcement is looking for um, <coughs> as part of their investigation and as a result of their warrant. So what do they do with it? Well, they can't, I mean, look, there's a way that you can go through these uh, spreadsheets and you can make a map. You can go get a list of where the cell phone towers are and you can map out where these different locations are on a big map. But obviously law enforcement does not have time for that, guys. And so what are they gonna do? They're gonna use proprietary software, okay? What the cops do is they get these, all of these um, spreadsheets, okay? And then they have access to, um, here in, in Minnesota and in our district, they use the CellHawk proprietary software. There may be other companies and other um, proprietary softwares that do this, that do cell site uh, an analytics, um, but I am familiar with this one just because they're using it uh, in our district, and it's my understanding they've used it in many other districts too. This software was created and produced by a former member of law enforcement for his brethren in law enforcement, okay? So this was basically made by and for the police. And doing my research uh, for this case, I went out and I looked for other types of software that could be free or that would be cheap or something that we could use to basically double check the results of this. And while I found some free software that I guess they're using in India, um, it was all in Hindi and that was totally useless for me. So, so we're stuck with what we've got here. And I just wanna tell you a little bit about this software so you kind of have an idea of what it does and why I, we should find it suspect. So the cops are gonna drag and drop their big pile of uh, spreadsheets into this web-based application, okay? And they're gonna put it in and bop, 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 bops. They're gonna come out, the cops are gonna come out with maps and graphs and guys, we love maps and graphs, don't we? We know the cops do. We know that our juries love that kind of demonstrative evidence. And that's basically what this is for, okay? And the CellHawk promotional materials, man, they really pump it up. They love bringing in the cops. They say that this software works with all kinds of cell phone related uh, data. Data sets including Celebrite reports, that's your cell phone extraction reports, um, tower dumps, GPS trackers like ankle bracelets. Sometimes uh, if you see you've got your trap and trace warrants uh, for GPS uh, tracking monitors, they say that they can analyze that stuff and make it into pretty uh, graphs and maps um, in, their, in their software. They can also take all of the phone calls listed in a specific device, uh, device's history and do what they call link analysis to find connections between multiple phones. And they can use this information to reveal conspirators and associates, 
okay? So they've got all this phone information and they start comparing it to other phones or looking at different devices within their uh, fence and they can see that phones are talking to each other and they start to see that as suspect. The software maps the locations of the anonymous devices onto the parameter or over a general area, usually a map. It can also map the um, <coughs> different phone numbers that the phone has been calling. So how do they use this information? Well, if the, uh, if the cops have a suspect already, okay, where there's someone that's identified to be a potential suspect in a crime, they can get the data from the sensor vault or from the telecommunications agents or companies and they can throw it in the cell hawk and come out with all these lovely graphs um, and maps to show where your client has been. However, if they do not have a suspect, this is where the phishing expedition comes in. Because if they don't have a suspect, they're gonna ask for all of this data within the fence itself, and then they're going to slowly narrow um, their, their search down to fewer and fewer devices and then request more information about those devices. So if they see a device kind of coming in and staying for a while and then leaving, they may think, oh, that device, they came in and they were there for a while, so clearly they were com committing a crime and we should ask for more of that data. And <coughs> what they'll do is they'll, once they figure out a, a device that they're interested in, um, they'll review that device and they'll ask for extra data to see the travel patterns with, for that device itself to see if it, I don't know, gives them more suspect information. Once they identify a device identification number that they believe to be related to the crime, they'll go back to Google with another warrant, with an additional warrant, that's what you see here, to disclose the identification of these suspect devices, okay? And this is now getting closer and closer to your client. They can then unlock an, an, uh, someone's phone number, an individual's phone number, and then eventually get their email address, social media credentials, further records from Facebook, et cetera, additional phone records for times and dates outside of that original perimeter. And they're basically narrowing it down to find your guy and charge him. Once they uh, get the data, and specifically for your guy, they can generate a hot list which shows the top 10 places that this person has gone, the top 10 numbers that they've um, dialed, patterns in their behavior uh, to monitor suspect collaboration. And what they'll do is once they get um, your client's cell phone information, they'll make this lovely graph, okay, generating a display of the towers that the subject device has hit during the quest requested time and date to make a lovely, lovely demonstrative piece of evidence for your jury to show, hey, obviously your defendant was near the crime scene because look where they went. They went here, they went here, they went here. Oh, they went right to the crime scene. Yeah, that's helpful. So what do we know about this sensor vault that has all of this information that will show where anybody within that fence has gone or will go or has gone or whatever. Since 2009, Google's Sensor Vault has collected data on users of Android smartphones and basically, and also Apple phones that access data or, or sorry, Google or Google products. And all of that information gets swept up into the Sensor Vault, okay? Any information from GPS signals, cell phone towers, nearby Wi-Fi devices, Bluetooth beacons, everything. Even if you have opted out of certain apps to say, don't follow me. If you're then using maps, or you're then using any, anything, pretty much, that connects to a cell tower or a, a satellite, that information is gonna be kept by Google. And where I, while I don't know where these Google sensor vault server farms are, certainly they've got a huge carbon footprint because I imagine they're in some, I don't know, magical d desert location that seeps 
who knows, unknown amounts, quantities of carbon for uh, air conditioning and whatever. But basically imagine like a server farm the size of this room, multiple ones of them, and they're just collecting, collecting, collecting data, and it just sits there waiting to be mined by law enforcement or other commercial entities. And the sensor vault is so vast and so unknown since Google completely controls everything about it that it, it, it has even come to the attention of Congress. And last spring, um, Congress started uh, getting a little uptight about this sensor vault thing and they sent a letter to Sundar Pichai, the CEO of Google, and they wanted to know some stuff. Who has access to the information in this sensor vault database? How accurate is the precise location information stored in this sensor vault? And what controls does Google provide to consumers to limit or revoke their access to this information? And while there was additional questions, I think ones that we, should, we would be asking would be, how do we know that this isn't hackable? How do we know that the people that are running this don't have some sort of bias or that there's some sort of inherent bias in automatically created into the algorithms themselves? There are no verification studies. There's no um, reliability studies. It's just Google gives the cops this information and they put it in their special program and then out comes this lovely map showing that your client was right at the crime scene right at the right time. Things to know about cell data records analysis. So Here's where we can start really putting the screws to this information. First of all, location data is never exact. They're gonna tell you that it is, but it's not. And that, come, that has to do with the nature of cell phones, how they interact with satellites and cell towers themselves. Your cell phone is trying to connect to the tower with the strongest and highest quality signal at any given moment, not the closest. The actual determination of which cell tower your phone is actually using um, is not listed in the records that are provided to law enforcement or to you through discovery. So they just want to like have you trust that it's all okay. There's no data for why your phone used one tower and not another. And some, and a lot of these um, spreadsheets, they'll only have data for certain towers and not others. And so sometimes you'll see your, you know, a phone hitting a cell tower, and it looks like it's close to something, but it's actually a borrowed cell tower from another company, and really you were in a different place, and your phone just happened to catch that tower because it had the strongest signal or beam width. Um, this, if the nearest cell tower is busy even if it's pretty strong, if it's overwhelmed by calls, then your cell phone is probably gonna pick up a different tower and that will change the precision logistics. The maps that law enforcement uses, especially in, in the cell hawk stuff, this, these are misleading. They want you to think that every cell tower ha has this lovely pie-shaped um, uh, radius, okay, where it looks like a little piece from, um, what is it, Trivial Pursuit, right? But in reality, here's what it is. Each cell tower that you see has basically three faces to it, okay, three antenna. And each one of these antenna has its own um, configuration, okay, and sometimes it's directed by the company, sometimes it's directed, I guess, by just its internal I don't know, information or whatever. But different sides of the antennas have different beam widths, they have different strengths. They're um, basically configured to get as much traction or as much cell phone traffic as they can. And so while the cell hawk will have um, the cell tower you know, broadcasting in this lovely um, pie-shaped shape, in reality, the location can actually go far out into different directions. And think about basically a cell tower, say, on the beach in San Diego, okay? It's got three sides, one side faces the ocean, the other two face very populated areas. That cell tower is gonna have more power and more beam width for the populated areas than it does for the one that's basically facing the ocean, right? And so think about that when you're thinking about other towers too in different locations because where your um, cell phone is hitting, it could be hitting the antenna of a powerful um, tower, 
but there are other sides of that tower too, and there are other towers, and some are configured to be able to hold more data than others just by its configuration and, and where it's located uh, on the ground, okay? So because there's differences in the con configuration and the actual um, bandwidth and beam width of cell towers, it's not the perfect uh, precision location creating mechanism that law enforcement um, wants you to think it is or wants our juries to think it is. So just keep that in mind. And in my materials, there's some um, more uh, information about how to attack the actual cell towers themselves. So let's talk about a little bit of law around this, what exists. And I know that in your own districts, you've got lots of Fourth Amendment uh, jurisprudence, and hopefully you've got some good law on cell phones and cell information. I'm gonna talk about three specific uh, Supreme Court cases that I think really um, show very clearly the turn that the Supreme Court is taking to co start really covering uh, cell phone data um, under the Fourth Amendment. So it started with Jones. I'm sure you all remember this. This is the case where the cops put a GPS uh, tracker on what they thought, what, what was he, a drug dealer or something, on his Jeep. And then basically they didn't follow the guy. They just let the tracker follow him for 28, 30 days. And then they got all the information and they got to see where this guy go, went and you know what drugs he allegedly sold, I guess. The Supreme Court was like, listen, if you're gonna tail this guy all day, that's one thing. But putting a GPS tracker to get all of this information that really isn't available unless you've got a team of you know, cops literally following this person every single moment of every single day they're in their car, which is almost impossible, this is a different level of surveillance. And so it requires a different level of protection. And this is the beginning of the Supreme Court saying, listen, we have to rethink what our reasonable expectation of privacy is, okay? For a long time, and even today, the government relies on this expectation of privacy saying, hey, look, you don't have an expectation of privacy on stuff that can be you know, seen just by surveilling you with regular surveillance, so how is it any different when we put a GPS tracking on? It's not. Well, the Supreme Court said, no, 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 it's, it's definitely different. And it's creeping up on our values for privacy. And I love uh, what Sonia Sotomayor says in this case because she kind of sticks it to Alito and she says, perhaps as Justice Alito notes, some people may find the trade-off of privacy for convenience worthwhile or come to accept this diminution of privacy as inevitable. I guess this is kind of what Zuckerberg is thinking, right? But she says, I for one doubt that people would accept without complaint the warrantless disclosure to the government of a list of every website they had visited in the last week or month or year. But whatever the societal expectations, they can attain constitutionally protected status only if our Fourth Amendment jurisprudence ceases to treat secrecy as a prerequisite for privacy. So what she's saying here, she's like, look, just be, we're not gonna give up uh, privacy for convenience. Okay, and we have to start really thinking about how the Fourth Amendment attaches and protects this kind of data. So the next case is Riley, and this is about cell phone data, right? This is the one where I think the government tried to compare a cell phone to a backpack and say, okay, well, when we arrest someone and they've got a backpack on, we get to search the backpack and what incident to arrest and whatever's in the backpack, that's for us. And so it should be the same with a cell phone. You get arrested with a cell phone, we get to look in it just like we look in the backpack. And the Supremes were like, mm, no, I don't think so. They're starting to really acknowledge the breadth of information that is kept on our cell phones and in our data and they're beginning to really um, understand that it needs protection. And so they acknowledge that a cell phone is part of our everyday life. And in fact, Justice Roberts said that cell phones are such a per pervasive and insistent part of daily life that the proverbial visitor from Mars might con conclude they were an important feature of human anatomy. I mean, think about it. I can see you all on your phones in the audience, okay? I know you're on them. They're basically an appendage, right? So don't we want this protected? 
And the Supreme Courts are like, yeah, yeah, we do. And that's really um, on display and kind of finally um, made really strong here in Carpenter. And this was uh, the most recent case. And it says, it kind of marries that tracking plus cell data. And it says, look, your cell phone can track you. It can track you for like the, what, 10 years, 11 years prior with this sensor vault stuff. This is really important and the government can't just get this willy nilly to do whatever they want. And because it, a cell phone faithfully follows its owner beyond public thoroughfares and into private residences, doctor's offices, political headquarters, and other potentially revealing locales, it deserves uh, greater protection. It's crazy now how much data they can get and how close they can get to your location using that data. And Carpenter acknowledges this and basically puts to rest this third party doctrine, okay? Originally the law was, look, your phone records, your landline phone records, they aren't subject to Fourth Amendment protection because you submit them to a third party. There's Ma Bell who actually keeps everything. And so therefore it's basically public and you, there shouldn't be a warrant requirement. No, the Supremes are like, no, 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 no. Unlike the nosy neighbor who keeps an eye on comings and goings, the telecom companies are an ever alert and their memory is nearly infallible, okay? This is the difference between like Mrs. Jones down the street watching you pull your car in and out of the driveway every day and Lord Sauron, the unblinking eye, right? Google is our Lord Sauron, the unblinking eye. Keep that in mind for those of you on your phones right now. So what do we do, okay? We've got this evidence, it's novel, the government wants to use it. How do we fight this? Well, I'm sure that the phone won't be the only piece of evidence in your case, hopefully not. If it is, well then you should have a good argument and we're gonna talk about that. Um, but the first thing you wanna do is you wanna talk about your theories of defense in terms of this phone. So maybe, hey, that wasn't my phone and there's some way to show that it wasn't your client's phone. That, wasn't, that was my phone, but it wasn't me. I may have been nearby, I was, you know, going to Papa John's next to the bank that was robbed, but that doesn't mean I was at the bank. Um, or this evidence is completely unreliable. So the first thing you wanna do is get discovery, okay? In my case, all of the raw data was disclosed along with the CellHawk reports. When you get your discovery, look, do you have the raw data? If not, you should get it. And in my materials, I've included a discovery request. Since I submitted these materials, um, I have another case, a homicide case, where this is, they're trying to use this data, and we have now moved um, to disclose the source code. And if you find yourself in a situation where you also may be requesting the source code or you want to, source code for CellHawk or for the, the uh, sensor vault, email me and I'll share, you, share with you um, my pleadings that I've drafted. But basically, if any of you are familiar with the source code litigation that went on about the data master, I know it happened in my state, I don't know if it happened in your states, but basically, we're gonna ask her the source code and say, look, show me the algorithm that says that this is reliable, show me. And where are your um, you know, verification studies and where are your reliability studies and where are your, um, you know, where, where's the data that says that, that there's nothing hacking this or there's no bias or whatever. We don't have that, right? So we wanna get the source code to potentially make even um, you know, some sort of fry Mac challenge to the reliability of it. But the first thing you wanna do is get this raw data. And you wanna determine whether the investigators actually got a warrant for it if, or if they got it using some other method. And if you want, and you should, hire an expert. If you'd like help finding an expert, you can contact the elect Electronic Frontier Foundation. They will help you find someone. I will tell you right now that the um, population of experts about this specific issue of these geofence warrants and the, um, the, the way the cell hawk stuff, ha there's just not a lot of them out there. There's plenty of 
uh, experts that can talk to you about Celebrite and cell phone extraction, but I'm still having a hard time finding a, an expert who can actually talk exactly about this. And I know the Electronic Fear Frontier Foundation um, is working on trying to find people too. So reach out to them. Um, if I find somebody, reach out to, or you can reach out to me and I'll sh share with you who I've found. If any of you find an expert that actually helps in this, please send it out to the rest of us, okay? Send it to me specifically because then I can present about it later. Um, <laughs> right? So, pretrial challenges. If there's no warrant, you are writing a motion to suppress based on lack of a warrant, and that should be the end of it, hopefully, right? File that motion to suppress. If there is a warrant, you're still filing that motion to suppress, okay? And you're filing that motion to suppress and you're gonna be making some arguments. Number one, that it lacks probable cause. The government is going to assume, and this is gonna be their argument, that everyone has a cell phone and every criminal has a cell phone in their pocket and they're using it before, during, and after the crime, okay? So that's their basis. They're like, cell phones are a part of everyday life, they're an appendage, obviously the criminals had cell phones, so we need to get all of the cell phone data within this perimeter surrounding this, the crime scene, right? And our response to that is like, um, no, because there's no probable cause. This is, <laughs> you're gonna see these warrants and your client, the beginning warrants, when they are asking for these um, geofence warrants, like the first one, there's not gonna be a name in the probable cause affidavit section. Why? Because they don't have a defendant. They don't have a suspect. This is kind of throwing, uh, or turning probable cause on its head, where they're like, well, we don't have a defendant or a suspect. We want to get all of this information so that we can find one, and then we'll ask for another warrant once we find that one to get all of their information. So it's kind of like this catch-22 needle in a haystack fishing expedition, and we have to point it out as such. So when the law says that, you know, Probable cause exists if under the totality of the circumstances, a showing of facts can be made sufficient to create a fair probability that evidence of a crime will be found in the place to be searched. The government's gonna say, look, everyone uses a cell phone. The cell phone data was present during the crime scene. So if we get this cell phone data around the crime scene, clearly that's probable cause. Well, they can say that, but we're gonna fight about it. We're gonna fight that there's an insufficient nexus, that there's no specific nexus between a phone or phone data and the criminal activity itself. And if you have a case like mine where there may be multiple fences in your original warrants and one fence actually ends up having information that leads to a suspect that the other fences don't, it just gets all this information and maybe your client's in there or not, that seems to me a complete lack of nexus whatsoever, and so you should be arguing that, and I have too. So we're gonna be hammering these, no probable cause, no nexus, and then our most important argument, insufficient particularity or overbreadth, okay? And this, this is where you get to dust off your history books and remember that history degree that you earned back however many years ago from college, and we're gonna talk about the founders because we'd like to remind the court that the Fourth Amendment was originally included in our Bill of Rights because the founders and the colonists were really sick of the crown coming in and ruffling and rummaging through their shit for no reason, right? The geofence warrant is basically today's, the modern version of the crown rifling through your shit. And the general warrant was the original fishing expedition. You're going to be making a similar argument. Judge, this geofence warrant is just a giant fishing expedition. It's a general warrant. It's akin to the king's agents going door to door and tossing your house for evidence of sedition without any other reason. No reasonable suspicion, nothing else, right? We're just, gonna, we're just gonna start going through everybody's cell phone information because maybe there'll be something there that helps us. And when it does, we're gonna use it. So when you're making this argument, 
you're going to include the, this information about the prohibitions against general warrants. It's in a lot of old Supreme Court jurisprudence, and we're going to bring that back and remind our judges of the same things that the founders were afraid of however many hundreds of years ago. We are still fighting that today. We should not have the cops just rummaging through our shit willy-nilly. Today, it's not the king. It's <laughs> Sindar Pichai. Okay, who's basically uh, the master of the general warrants. And he's who, well, I don't mean to like single him out completely, but Google is now kind of the bad guy and the government's working with them. This is important. It has actually happened. They have actually used data from these uh, geofence warrants to target people who have not actually been the uh, perpetrators of crime. There was a man in Arizona, okay, who was charged with murder and held in custody for a long time while they figured out that, no, it wasn't his cell phone at the crime scene. You know what it was? It was some dude that he knew who actually did the murder, and one time, however many weeks prior to the murder, this guy logged into his Gmail on this other dude's phone okay, and never logged out and whatever, and Gmail under this guy's credentials was still running when the dude who's, who actually, I guess, committed the murder had the phone in his pocket. And so this innocent man was held in custody for however long while they figured out that his alibi of being at home Netflix and chilling with his girlfriend across town was actually where he was instead of at this crime scene you know, with this other guy you, who happened to have his Google credentials logged in on his phone. And this guy had to hire a lawyer who then had to get um, additional cell phone records to show that, no, he was actually really at home with his girlfriend. But this mi mix up and this assumption and these um, conclusions that the officers can jump to can really ruin people's lives. In Raleigh, I think this is North Carolina, yeah, there was a giant arson Okay, and they didn't know who committed the arson, but the Raleigh police did one of these geofence warrants and basically not only included the place that was caught, that caught on fire, but like several blocks around it, right? And just got all of this information. And while I don't know what exactly happened with that, I know that there was a case out of the Eastern District of Virginia, a bank robbery, and in that case, law enforcement got a geofence um, warrant for a perimeter including the bank, a Ruby Tuesday, a Hampton Inn, a senior apartment building, a mini storage facility, and a church. The government's argument in um, supporting its warrant was that there was no reasonable expectation of privacy in that data, and so it doesn't matter whose data it was or where it was found, there's not a reasonable expectation of privacy. But recall a few slides ago, guys, the Supremes have already kind of established that. And we really need to hammer this, that we do have a reasonable expectation of privacy over our data. And specifically, um, in that case, I read the pleadings, um, the defense argued that there's not only a reasonable expectation of privacy um, for our data, no matter where it is, but also that, that this also implicated First Amendment concerns when people were in church and their data was swept up in this. So what does this amount to where they're just getting all this data and you know, trying to find a needle in a haystack or accusing someone who actually wasn't the offender? It's a fishing expedition and it stinks, it stinks. So while you're doing this and you're challenging the warrant, look out for Leon. You may, I assume that most of you know about this, basically, if a search warrant lacks probable cause but the evidence seized was um, pursuant to a search warrant and the officers were acting under good faith, then everything's okay. The good faith exception doesn't apply in certain circumstances. When the affidavit uh, contained false statements, when the judge abandoned it, his or her role in issuing the warrant, when it's so lacking of indicia of probable cause, 
or when it's facially deficient so that no police officer could reasonably presume it to be valid. We're gonna be making these arguments saying that, hey, this data is unreliable, that there's no way to verify its reliability or its veracity, and so by its inclusion in a warrant, I guess you can argue that um, it's facially deficient. I don't know, I'll let you guys get creative with that with your individual cases, but just be aware of this. And I know that this uh, whole seminar this weekend is about um, challenging evidence pre-trial, but I thought that I'd help you guys out and add some trial strategy here for you too. First of all, you wanna make some motions in limine, okay? You're gonna be arguing that cell site location information that any probative value is substantially outweighed by the danger of confusion, misleading the jury, unfair prejudice. This stuff is unreliable, we don't know where it came from, there's no way to verify that the precision is correct. This is, you know, these beautiful maps and graphs are only gonna serve to pr prejudice the jury and it shouldn't be included. Federal Rule of Evidence 702, don't let law enforcement officers testify as experts and um, don't let, for lack of qualification, I should say, and then don't let them uh, testify as experts because the information itself, the data, um, is unreliable. So you can use these as you want. And finally, motion to prohibit the introduction of this information because it cannot be sufficiently authenticated. And maybe they'll say, oh, we got this letter from Google, it's totally authentic. Um, but I think you, understand now, and you've learned from our previous speaker, that authentication should be something that we uh, fight and that you can use, hopefully, 901 to help you in that fight. So if you've lost your pretrial challenge and you've lost your motions in limine, don't fret, they're still voir dire, okay? You wanna talk to the jurors about how they perceive this information, this data, what do they know about this technology, and you wanna plant a seed of doubt. And you wanna know about this and what they're thinking and potentially plant doubt because we all know that when our jurors go home, they're watching CSI Miami, or CSI Cyber, I should say. CSI Miami, CSI NY, NCIS, NCIS Los Angeles, which I love because LL Cool J's hot, and finally, the inspectors wired for justice, right? So like, we know that our jurors are being fed all of this totally bullshit data um, or evidence information, information on TV, and we wanna get a hold of what they think they know, right? And I know that we ask these questions specifically when you've got DNA in a case, right? Because you wanna know, do they really think that a DNA result can be established in 45 minutes? No. Um, we also want to know, is there a way to talk to them and, and see if there's areas of undermining the, the government's case just by using the juror's own skepticism? So you want to ask the jurors, do you watch the cop shows? How accurate do you think they are? Do you trust the technology you see on TV? How aware are you of the data inside your cell phone that goes to the carrier? Do you think it's too intrusive? Do you trust Google? This should be an area of great debate and discussion, right? And for those of you, like uh, in my district, we get to use panel um, voir dire, and this is a great thing to get the jurors talking, right? Do you trust Google? Why or why not? Do you think technology is perfect? What scares you about the government having access to your cell phone data? You might get an objection, but not from the jurors, guys. On cross, you're gonna be crossing the cop or whoever's presenting this, in, this dumb information. They have no relevant education, knowledge, or training experience, okay? When you have, most likely, you will have some agent of law enforcement who comes into your trial to um, present these lovely graphs and, and maps, right? Well, Chances are the only training they've had on this is some sort of like three-day seminar put on by the Cellhawk Analytics Corporation, okay, where I'm sure they get some sort of like trusty little certificate of completion. But the cops that are testifying most likely do not have backgrounds in technology. They've never worked for a telecom company. They've, they don't know anything about 
testing of technology or verification studies. They don't know about algorithms. They don't know about, I don't know, 1011, that stuff. Like, we want to bring it to the juror's attention that these cops are basically just barfing out what the proprietary program gives them, and we don't know anything about that. So to that end, you can cross on how unreliable the sensor vault data is because it's managed completely by Google employees. They're completely in charge of any of the security protocols, any of the uh, algorithms or the, um, I don't know, the, the stuff that Google does, the tech stuff, right? We don't know anything about it. We're lawyers. They don't know anything about it either. They're just cops, so bring that up because they don't know. We don't know if there's any errors or if there's any um, biases, right? Google doesn't let us in. They don't let us peek behind the curtain. They don't let the cops peek behind the curtain either. That's something that you want to bring up. Same with the cell hawk programming or whatever proprietary program your law enforcement is going to use. Um, you didn't use comparable products to verify the results. You just dragged your spreadsheet into the internet using an online portal. You don't know what goes on behind that portal, do you? And the CellHawk produces these maps with these lovely pie shapes, but that's not really how the cell phone coverage actually looks, is it? Right? We hope that that's their answer. The cops are going to give you some dribble, whatever. You're bringing this to the juror's attention, OK, and to a, the judge's attention. And you know, you want to start laying some seeds of doubt that the precision is not what uh, the precision of the location data is not what law enforcement says it is. You may want to call your expert as a witness to explain the weaknesses in the data or explain data that the investigators missed, right? Because there may be stuff in there or there may be stuff that they can get separately that completely negates what the cops have shown. And an expert will be able to help you with that. And explain potential exculpatory ex evidence. And once you have crossed this cop and you've made your arguments, then you can celebrate your win because obviously you're awesome and you've taken all this to heart and you've totally won and you've ruled the world and everything's great. I suggest that one thing you do before you leave here is also to disable the location accuracy in your cell phones and to stop Google tracking, even though it probably won't do much. So I hope that now you've got an understanding of what these uh, geofence warrants actually look like, what to look for in your discovery, how to fight them. I do have some additional pleadings that weren't included um, in the materials because I found them later or I wrote them later, including um, a memo from the Eastern District of Virginia that does a great explanation of the history um, of Fourth Amendment jurisprudence and cell, cell phones. And if you have any in, uh, questions or if you want some help, please reach out. I'm in Minneapolis. It's cold. And if you're someplace warm, I will come to you. Thank you. <laughs>